So I'm grateful today to Bert, one Reverend Bert Burleson, who is uni university chaplain in uh, Baylor University, Waco in Texas, for this reflection on uh, Acts chapter 9. The Acts of the Apostles could equally have been called the Acts of God. Actually, the best and the most accurate title would have been the Acts of the Apostles in response to and in synchronicity with the Acts of God. The early Christians likely knew this was the case, but this dissertation-like title would have taken away too much papyrus. So, Acts it was and acts, it remains. However short the title, the larger emphasis is important because on every page of this book, there is a story where someone, an apostle, a believer, a seeker, even an adversary, and the Holy Spirit are acting and acting in response to some other action or incident or hunch or conversation or crisis. Everything and everyone seems connected because, of course, they are. Chapter upon chapter, there is a mystical unfolding where the, the early church must surely say over and over again, well, how about that? It is surprise upon surprise and new thing upon new thing. God is at work, but so too are the awakened ones, each responding to the other or to, block capitals, the other. It's fitting that centuries later we read these texts just after Easter. Because we need to be caught up again in a reality that seems almost magical and not so mundane. Our heart's intuition and the witness of our faith is that life is very mysterious and abundantly connected. And we want to, we need to step trustfully into that sense of connection as Easter people, that sense of synchronicity. And synchronicity was and is a term coined by the psychologist Carl Jung. Synchronicity is when things, two things happen and they, they seem to have a strange connection, which is more than um, cause and effect. This is what we see going on all the time in the book of Acts. Easter life swings on the hinges that there is someone at work beyond our something. And that door opens for us with that curious engagement with life, just as it did for the first followers. The apostles always seem to be just following the next clue in a very, in what seems like a very itinerant, wandering existence. And it is in chapter 9 that we find Peter wandering. We find him wandering from church to church. If you've got your Bibles open, you'll notice that before the story of Tabitha, there is uh, another miraculous story, the story of Aeneas, a bedridden man, a paralyzed man, who immediately hops up as Peter prays for him, and the healing turns many to faith. And then there is that even more miraculous journey to Joppa, where Tabitha is raised from the dead, the news of which, again, understandably, gives rise to belief. All of this happens in just a few sentences. But then it seems to happen like that pretty much on every page in the book of Acts. Resurrection, faith turning, belief raising kinds of things. One act, an actor, commingling with the next 
in holy synchronicity. We sort of get the feeling as we read Acts that the the whole world at this time seems elevated into the kingdom of God where the limitations of this realm are not reigning. There seem to be different rules in that realm. And the apostles are simply trusting what is happening and then saying again, well, how about that? It seems to have been electric in those early days. And I guess the burning question is, can it still be that way? We might wonder and ponder about that question as our sanctuary remains draped in white and our lilies still fragrant. Because this is the world to which we are called, particularly during Easter tide, but actually every day of our lives. The other thing we notice about these two miracles in Acts chapter 9 is that they have a lot of resonance with some of the gospel stories. Get up and make your bed. Get up and roll up your mat, Peter says to the man paralyzed for many years, echoing the language that Jesus uses in chapter 5 of John's gospel. The writer of Acts says that the man gets up immediately at once, again mirroring a healing at the pool and other miracles in the Gospels. And the raising of Tabitha has many parallels with, for example, Mark chapter 5, where Jesus, the well-known miracle worker, is sent for. He enters a house full of mourners. They get ordered out of the room, and he says, get up. And that command is obeyed by the deceased. There is clearly a consciousness about the way these stories are being told in the early church. This language may be a way of reinforcing that Jesus is still at work. And Peter makes this emphasis by saying, Jesus Christ heals you. Underlining that the church's ministry is an extension of Jesus' ministry. The miracle of Tabitha, who was dead, but presented alive, also has obvious spiritual connections to Easter. She was beloved, always doing good and helping the poor, we are told. And her friends, they gather in their love and in their pain. This is often the state of God's people coming together, banding together because of what the world does to us, to anybody and everybody. This is what we were doing on Thursday at Pam's funeral, gathered together in love and in pain. We face death together in so many ways, and yet we always gather and we hope for new life. This is a familiar place. Again, is it just coincidence or more than coincidence that this rebirth, this movement from death to life, takes place in Joppa? Joppa is modern-day Tel Aviv. But more importantly, it's a place mentioned in the book of Jonah. It's the port from which Jonah flees from the will of God. Only this time, there is no fleeing from the will of God. Peter is obedient. But if we think about the story of Jonah, Jonah is a story of descent. Jonah goes down to Joppa. He goes down in the ship. He goes down in the water. He goes down in the fish. And Tabitha has gone down too. And this is the path of every follower. But death leads to life. The way down is the way up. This is the Easter hope. Luke 
never really seems to linger with any of the miracle stories in Acts. He simply reports that someone was raised to new life and lots of people believe because of it. And then the story moves on in its usual way. We hear that Peter stays in Joppa for a while and he stays in the home of Simon the Tanner. Now this is another miracle in itself. An Orthodox Jew living in an extremely unclean place. A tanner's house with its association with all kinds of dead animals would have been normally been completely off limits. So this is a kind of a miracle too. Even at this point is Simon Peter's, are Simon Peter's eyes being opened to how God's love and power is to be reaching out to all peoples. Most of these miracles that we get in Acts are just reported off the cuff, likely not noticed by most people, but still amazing for those disciples with Easter eyes. Yes, we are told right at the end of our reading, Peter stayed with Simon the Tanner. Well, how about that? And it is in this thoroughly unclean place that an even greater miracle takes place. But more of that next week. Amen.